Christine Flowers is a syndicated columnist who wrote for the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Daily News for over 17 years. She has been a regular panelist on six ABC Public Affairs Roundtable, Inside Story since 2006, and has hosted a radio talk show on 1210 AM WPHT. A graduate of Marion Mercy Academy, she obtained her AB from Bryn Mawr and her JD from Villanova. Eric Ortz is the Guardsmark Professor at the Warden School of the University of Pennsylvania. He's a professor in the Legal Studies and Business Ethics Department with a joint appointment in the Management Department. Professor Ortz is also known for his faculty activism in support of Fossil Free Penn and calling on the university to investigate President Trump's academic record during his time at Penn. <laughs> Governor Ed Rendell has a long career of service in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and Democratic Party politics. He began his career as the District Attorney of Philadelphia from 1978 to 1986, later serving as the 96th Mayor of Philadelphia and the 45th Governor of Pennsylvania. He also served as General Chair of the DNC during the 2000 presidential election. He received his BA from Penn in 1965 and is a current faculty member teaching a course titled Who Gets Elected and Why? The Science of Politics, which for public disclosure, I will say I audited in the fall of 2019. Um, I, didn't, I didn't get a grade, so I have no incentive to be um, <laughs> or harsher. Uh, and finally, Michael Smokanish is the host of the Michael Smokanish program on Sirius XM channel 124, the host of CNN's Smokanish on Saturday mornings, a newspaper columnist and an author. While still in college, he was an advanced, advanced man, excuse me, for then Vice President George H.W. Bush, who later appointed him to a sub-cabinet level position as regional administrator for the <coughs> Department of Housing and Urban Development under then Housing and Urban Development Secretary Jack Kemp. So I want to thank, once again, all four of our panelists for being here, taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with the Penn community. Um, so as I mentioned, the topic of this panel is counting to election day, in quotation marks, a bipartisan panel. So, if, um, so going in that same <coughs> order, um, I'll start with you, Ms. Flowers. Just maybe, I want every, every panelist to take maybe one or two minutes to talk maybe a little bit of, more about their background and kind of what your impressions are of the 2020 elections and maybe focusing specifically on the importance and role of the state of Pennsylvania. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for asking me to, uh, to be on the panel tonight. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm quite honored. I know people say that, um, but it's not a platitude in my case. I'm, I'm really honored that you uh, wanted to hear my opinion. Um, my background, as uh, you've heard, is in uh, punditry, for the most part, commentary. Um, I also am an attorney. I'm an immigration attorney, immigration lawyer. And I have a great, deep, and abiding love for the city of Philadelphia and the state of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm really happy that Pennsylvania is playing such an important role in the election this year. We really are the keystone. Um, I had written a, a column for CNN.com about how Pennsylvania could still uh, go for Donald Trump. But beyond the, the partisan nature of it, Pennsylvania really is a bellwether for so many of the other states, not just because of the, the large electoral prize that we represent, but because of the diversity in the demographics. And I, again, I'm very excited about this election. I have my opinions about what might happen. And I really look forward to engaging with the other panelists tonight and with the members of the Penn community. So thank you. Professor Ortz, um, any opening statements that you would like to make? Yeah, well, um, let me just say, uh, let me also add uh, a thank you to both the Mitchell Center and to the Student uh, Political Union for doing this uh, session. And I think it's especially important in this time of polarization for us to find uh, areas where we can all d discuss issues, uh, be on different sides of them, uh, and do it in a civil manner. And uh, so I really like, uh, I, I'm very grateful to have that opportunity. Having said that, I'm an extreme partisan on this, <laughs> on the election. I, I'm, I'm, I might be described as Wharton's anti-Trump. As you mentioned, I've uh, uh, pushed for him to be investigated with respect to um, his uh, admissions 
what what seems to be an alleged what is at least alleged to be an admissions fraud but i more more generally i think he's a threat to the rule of law and to our democracy so this is an extremely important election both with respect to democracy and preserving our our democracy and another uh, main issue uh, that I have con I have concern about, which is climate, um, and so I think on both those uh, areas, this is a very important election. I've been following this uh, particularly from the point of view of the Senate races, though. Also, um, it looks like the uh, it's pretty. Uh, it, Biden has a very high chance of winning, according to most of the analyses that I've seen. Uh, so the more interesting races uh, seem to be coming down to the U.S. Senate races. So uh, if you want to talk about those kinds of issues, uh, I think there are some very interesting uh, uh, cases to talk about. But thanks again for, uh, for, uh, for bringing, the, bringing us all together. Thank you. Um, Governor Rendell, if you're able to, um, would you like to give your one or two minute opening statement? Okay, I'm going to give a little different take. My hope is that Pennsylvania will not decide this election. And it's a fervent hope because if we're deciding this election, we're in big trouble. Uh, the trouble came from the fact that we switched to mail voting. Uh, we, before this year, the law in Pennsylvania only allowed for absentee ballots by mail. And to qualify for an absentee ballot, you have to either be out of the county on business or personal matters or be disabled. That was the only way you could do a mail ballot. This year we switched to mail ballots. We actually did it before the onset of COVID. Uh, we switched to mail ballots, but we didn't change the provision that says mail ballots, what were used to be absentee ballots, a very small number, couldn't be counted. Regardless of when they were received, they couldn't be counted until starting at 7 a.m. on election day. So we're gonna have probably close to 2 million mail ballots, which won't be able to be counted until starting 7 o'clock on election day. And most of our election officials will have to run the polls, so they really won't be started to be counted until 8 o'clock on election night. And if the primary is any example, it took seven days to count the mail ballots in the primary and determine that Mina Ahmed had won the Auditor General's primary on the Democratic side. So the answer to that was to change the law to allow counting to begin early, like Florida and North Carolina. Florida and North Carolina have early voting, but they tabulate the votes as they come in. They're not allowed to release them, but they tabulate them as they come in. So the early vote is all counted by the time the polls close in Florida and North Carolina. So Pennsylvania, Democrats put in a bill saying that we wanted three days permission to start counting three days before election day, count the mail ballots. Unfortunately, the Republicans voted against that, and since they control both houses of the legislature, that bill didn't pass. So if this is an election where Pennsylvania's electoral votes will decide the winner, the eyes of the nation will be on us, and my guess is it'll take four or five days, if it's close, to determine who wins the election because there are so many mail-in ballots. So I hope that Florida or Georgia or somebody else decides it. Finally, um, Mr. Smokanish, if you would like to give your opening statement. I'd rather be Joe Biden than Donald Trump. I tend to believe the polling data. I think that the polls received a bad rap in the last cycle. The national polls were pretty prescient. The last Real Clear Politics average had Secretary Clinton up by about three. She ended up winning the popular vote by two. That's not bad. There were definitely inadequacies in Pennsylvania and in the upper Midwest states, Michigan and Wisconsin. I think those polling outfits have improved their game. I think that there's more polling that's been done in this cycle than was done four years ago. Having said all that, I don't think the race is over. I think that there's still an opportunity for a momentum shift. I'm reminded of the fact that tomorrow is the four year anniversary of FBI Director Jim Comey saying that he needed to reopen an investigation into Anthony Weiner's laptop. There have been so many intangibles in this cycle that haven't moved the needle. If you go back to the Real Clear Politics average and take a look one year 
in advance of this election, meaning November 3rd, 2019, you'll see that Joe Biden against Donald Trump, Biden has an 8.1% lead. If you look at it as of yesterday, it was 8.9 points, meaning with all the tumult and all the ups and downs and all the chaos that has surrounded this administration, nothing has really moved the needle. And yet, because of the lessons of four years ago, I'm still hesitant to say that, uh, that this thing is, is over. I know we don't elect by national poll, um, but I believe Nate Silver's analysis when he says that Joe Biden needs to win that popular vote by three plus points in order to be secure in the electoral college. And that if that margin, whether it's eight, whether it's nine, whether it's seven, should dip to five or below, all of a sudden we have a horse race and Governor Rendell's worst case scenario of us being the focus of the nation for three or four days after the election comes true. Thank you all very much um, for your introductions and for once again being here. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Root, the speaker of the Penn Political Union to begin uh, the period of questioning. It's so ominous sounding. Um, thank you, Justin. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm the speaker of the Penn Political Union, and I would like to reiterate what Justin just said and thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, so I just want to give everyone a brief overview of how this is going to go. Um, I have been uh, given a list of questions by my five caucus chairs. Um, two of my caucus chairs are actually here tonight, and that would be Haven Lerner and Chris uh, Tremoglier and they will be speaking later with their own questions. Um, but to start everything out, I want to uh, just give the question, um, sort of, sorry, give the panelists a, a broad question. Um, I have grown up in Pennsylvania. I am essentially a lifelong resident of the suburbs of Philadelphia. So Pennsylvania politics plays a very important role um, in my life and in my heart. Um, and I, I want to first ask, what do you, the panelists see as the most important issue um, facing the election in Pennsylvania um, today? I, you know, um, there are so many competing things. I'm an immigration lawyer, so immigration is a big issue. Climate, obviously, with, with respect to Professor Root. I really think the most important thing about Pennsylvania politics right now is Trump versus Biden. I really think that this is coming down to the character and the personality of two diametrically opposed candidates. I have talked to so many people um, in writing columns, in dealing with, with clients, uh, talking to friends on social discrete issues. I believe that Christine is... Uh Frozen, unfortunately. Frozen, yeah. All right. Um, Professor Ortz, would you like to, you seemed like you had a, a response. Oh, well, um, this might not be what you're asking, but one interesting, I think, problem, and I agree with the Trump versus Biden as, a, as the key dividing issue right now. One big question is what's going to happen with the Supreme Court? So we now have uh, the rush of a new uh, justice, uh, Justice Barrett, uh, to be put on the court, and there's going to be some election cases that are coming up. And the Supreme Court has demonstrated what I regard as an extremely worrisome um, uh, interest in interfering with the state's uh, process of how they're deciding elections. And so, as Governor Rendell indicated, there were recent changes on the Pennsylvania system. They haven't worked too well. And there was a case that went up to the Supreme Court and a deadlock four to four, which meant that the current system that was in place was allowed to go forward. But now that there's a five to four uh, potential majority of, um, of justices who want to interfere with electoral politics, I'm worried that uh, there will be an intervention if, if it did come down to Pennsylvania or some other states. There are a lot of problems in other states uh, as well. And I'm really, I'm somewhat concerned that the Supreme Court will intervene uh, in, into the business of how do you decide elections. And I think that that could be very worrisome, not only for our system, but the court itself. If the court is seen as 
uh, intervening once again as it did in Bush versus Gore, but in this case even more uh, questionably, I think, uh, then we could really be in for a constitutional um, roller coaster that is not going to be very pleasant. Any further comments um, from uh, Governor Rendell or uh, Mr. Smirkanish? Well, I agree with uh, Christine. I think this is an election that will be decided by a character, which is why I think Joe Biden will prevail, but it, it'll be decided by character. We've seen a lot of ads, but to me, the most persuasive ad was a blonde woman looked like she was in her late 30s who just said, I voted for Donald Trump in 2016, but I've had enough. I just can't take this anymore. And I think that's the way the majority of Americans feel, and they're looking for normalcy and they're looking for someone of, they're looking for a good man and Joe Biden may have faults, but he's a good man. Sarah, I'll just piggyback on what the governor said. You framed the question as a Pennsylvanian. I'm a lifelong Pennsylvanian as well, but I was sitting here and I was thinking if you had said that you'd spent your entire life in Illinois or Texas or any state and wanted to know what's the number one issue, I would have answered the exact same way. I view it as a referendum. It's not a choice election. It's a referendum on Donald Trump. And I think that he's worked hard and has failed in trying to position it as a choice election. He did a better job in the second and final presidential debate. He came on in that first debate and was so boorish and, and so um, obstructionist of former Vice President Biden that he never gave him the opportunity to answer any question. And at the end of the night, what did people think? Um, they framed their opinion based on Donald Trump and Donald Trump alone. And I think that's typical of the election. In the last debate, when he backed off, maybe because of the mute button, you saw more of a contrast between the two. But when you look at the data, it suggests that people are largely voting based on what they think of him. Two thirds of of a, a 5,000 sample Pew survey from two months ago said they were casting their ballots for Joe Biden because of Donald Trump. And, and we see that in a lot of elections, but I don't think to this extent. It's all about him for better or for worse. And finally, Ms. Flowers, you were uh, unfortunately cut off by technological issues. Would you like to continue your statement, respond to anything? You're, um, muted currently. Technical problems. There we go. Um, I'm actually glad that it happened the way it did, even though it was, it was sort of serendipitous because we were able to hear the governor and, and Michael speak as well. And it, it kind of feeds into one of the things that I was, was talking about. Um, it is definitely, as Michael says, it is a referendum on Donald Trump. It's also a referendum, I think, in some ways on what has happened in the last few months. Um, if you were listening, if you could hear, there were helicopters flying around in the background outside my window. I'm in Center City, Philadelphia. Stores were shut down tonight, boarded up. The city is quiet. We are in a, an environment right now, tonight, very similar to the environment that we were in after um, the, the murder of George Floyd. People are afraid that there is going to be some um, activity this evening in the streets. And I have heard people say that this plays into the idea of conflict between the police, conflict between social justice activists, advocates. And I think that this also is going to have some impact on the way that people look at this election because for better or for worse, there is a large chunk of the population that believes that Joe Biden has not effectively addressed the violence, the increasing violence in the streets. Um, there are those who blame Donald Trump for the violence, for triggering it, the, the whole idea of the BLM movement. So I really do think that, again, this is a referendum, not on specific discrete issues, but on the two men who represent two very polar opposite approaches to how we can improve the United States. Um, but I just think it's incredibly interesting that we're having this conversation tonight and things are happening in the streets outside. We're, do, we're virtual right now, but there's actual activity taking place in the streets that may impact one week out the election. 
Thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to invite uh, our Conservative Caucus Chair, Chris. Um, are you there, Chris? Yes, I am. Hold on one second. Sorry, technical. All good. Go. Would yep, you good. like to ask your first question? Sure. Um, okay, so the first question, can everyone actually hear me okay? All right, great. Hi, Chris. Yep. Hey, Christine, how you doing? Good. Alrighty, so the first question that I have is, since Trump won the Republican primary in 2016, politicians on the left have routinely decried threats to our democracy and doomsday predictions, yet none of them have even remotely come true. Why is this type of fear-mongering used, and why does it continue in this election? I don't want to monopolize the conversation, so I want to let it, somebody else speak. Well, I guess I'll, I'll, guess I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, since I did, I did mention that I think that this is one of the most important elections that we've had in at least my lifetime because of the potential threat that I think the Trump administration, not just uh, the president, but the entire administration poses for the rule of law. And so I think that there are quite a few examples of that. Uh, one, I'll just, I'll just leave us with one. Uh, you have a president of the United States who is asking the attorney general to uh, go after people for political reasons, uh, to, to use the criminal justice system uh, to prosecute or to indict the opponent. Uh, now, you could say, well, he's just saying that. But I, I think when you have a president who just says stuff like that, and then you actually do have actions where in the case of uh, Attorney General Barr, um, there have been a lot of problems in terms of how he's been handling things, including the uh, Mueller investigation uh, and a number of other kinds of issues that this is, uh, it does raise an issue of, of that kind. So I think, I think it's not fear mongering to say that. I think it's a question of what do you stand for? What is our system? What does our system stand for? And do you follow certain basic constitutional rules uh, and laws? Or are the laws for some people over here but they don't really apply to us. Uh, one other example I'll just give um, is uh, uh, one of our colleagues at the, uh, at the Penn Law School, Claire Finkelstein, uh, together with Richard Painter, have just asked for an investigation for Hatch Act violations that the president seems to have committed with respect to orders to use the powers of the presidency for political reasons. Uh, maybe one of the uh, most obvious ones is having rallies at the White House. That's never happened before. You never, we've never used uh, personnel at the White House or, or have military people or officials show up in an event like that for a political purpose. So I think those are just a few examples of why I think this election is about our democratic system. And I don't think it's fear mongering to say that. I think it's just a question of uh, what do you stand for? Respectfully, I must strongly, strongly, strongly disagree with you. Um, I don't think that would be what you categorized um, Attorney, Jar, Attorney General Barr did. That seems to be more of opinion than facts based. And you brought up the fact that he was targeting um, opposition. I don't know what you would be referring to. I mean, if we're going back on that particular case, then did you have the same objections when Attorney General Eric Holder and the IRS were targeting conservative groups when Obama was president. So there seems to be kind of a, you know, a mix max of like liberals can do one thing, but when conservatives do it, it's a threat to democracy. And I have to challenge you on that there. Well, maybe rather than go into a what about, what about the previous administration, I'll, I'll let other people weigh in and, and see what others might think about whether this, about this issue raised. Sure, no problem. Thank you for your answer. Mr. Smirkash, you're, you're, you're muted. Chris, I'm not here to, to carry water for either of these individuals, but the way in which the question was asked seemed to imply that the president has clean hands and has been victimized by investigations during the course of his presidency. And I guess my first response would be to remind everybody that although not convicted, he was impeached. And so much has gone on in the span of the last four years that I do this for a living. All I do is read in and comment on the news. And yet, recently when the subject came up on my radio program of his impeachment, I, I had a mental block and I couldn't remember what exactly gave rise to the impeachment. 
uh, which I attribute not only to my age, but also to the fact that there's been a fire hose of information on his watch. Um, he was impeached for having leveraged his office to get Ukraine to do an investigation of the Bidens. Um, additionally, allegedly, he, allegedly did that. That no, was I'm, I'm simply, not I'm true. simply I'm making. I'm violent. simply. Yeah, I'm simply making the statement that he was impeached. You can argue that that was a partisan vote. But he was. It was Fine. a not guilty verdict. So I said. Happen. First thing I said was, although not convicted, mm -hmm. he was impeached. He, he's going to bear that forever. The second thing that I would say is that the Mueller probe concluded that while there was no collusion, there was obstruction of justice. And you might say to me, well, wait a minute, Mueller reached no conclusion with regard to obstruction. And I would push back on that and say, he absolutely did. If he believed that there was no obstruction, he would have said so much as he said there was no collusion. And instead, he wrote a report where he essentially said he didn't believe it was his job where a president couldn't defend himself against charges, given that he can't be indicted while in office, to say so. But, but anyone who waded through that document, as I did, um, would know that that was his finding. So I, I just offer those as, as two examples of, of suggestions that, you know, the doom and gloom characterization of him, while sometimes exaggerated, in other instances has come true. But the Russian investigation um, turned Chris, out to be not true at all. Of time, Chris, in the interest no, of time, no I, I would like to keep the questions moving. Um, Absolutely. And with that, I'll invite our Liberal Caucus Chair, Haven Lerner, to ask his uh, question. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, my question is pretty simple. How do you think the media's treatment of Trump has changed from 2016 to 2020? Hey, Haven. Can I jump in on that one since um, I am a... Uh... <laughs> I am Anyone a, can I, jump in. I guess you could say I'm part of the media, although, um, as I said, again, I am a, uh, a commentator, a pundit, which, so, I mean, there's that underlying, you know, we start from the point that I have a bias. Um, I'm, even in the description of, of my profile here, I'm a conservative columnist, so it's no surprise that I find, I think, that the current uh, treatment of President Trump is unfair. I think it's become increasingly um, polarized to the extent that you have a few news sources that are more or less balanced and they, they, they try and present the, uh, the good and the bad. And I want to give a shout out to Michael Smirkanish simply because I think he's one of the finest in the business. Uh, he really does try and thread the needle and I think he's extremely fair in his treatment. However, I also find that so many in the media are, are requiring or are holding Donald Trump to a bar, a threshold, a standard that they have not held other presidents to. Understood that Donald Trump is sui generis. He is not like any other president that we've ever seen in terms of personality. But at the very beginning, from the very beginning of his administration, Donald Trump has been viewed with a jaundiced eye by many in what is called the mainstream media. Um, people have said he has uh, sort of triggered this by the whole fake news uh, mantra that he has used over and over again. But if you look very closely at some of the reporting, while I don't like the term fake news, I do think that there has been some manipulation of facts and incidents and situations to make them look much worse, different, um, skewed than they actually are. Um, for example, last night, I was watching the swearing in of Amy Coney Barrett, um, Supreme Court Justice, now Justice Barrett. I was looking at four or five different networks to see how they were presenting this, the swearing in, first the confirmation vote, and then the swearing in. Three of the networks on the, uh, the banners that were, you know, the, what is it, what are they called? The, um, the chirons at the bottom. Um, they were Trump holds Rose Garden ceremony uh, in the midst of COVID crisis. One of them said, Trump holds super spreader 
event in the Rose Garden as Amy Coney Barrett is being sworn in. C-SPAN and one other network were fairly straightforward in stating this is the swearing in of a Supreme Court justice, albeit a controversial confirmation, but she was being sworn in. And yet, as I said, on three other networks, it was, there is this uh, you know, danger to the public that this woman is being sworn in in public. So I just, I just think, you know, that's just one example, but I do think that the media um, has some in the media, I can't say the media, but I do think that some in the media have, uh, have treated him extremely unfairly. Well, I would say <laughs> that he brings it on himself. First of all, he attacks the media. Um, he tries to diminish or de degrade some people in the media, uh, particularly women reporters, often African-American reporters. He brings a lot of that on himself. But I don't think if you look at the political scale tipping that the media has done, I don't think Donald Trump's been a victim. I think you can make a good case that the New York Times, which he calls fake news, which he calls the enemy, which he calls part of the liberal media, that the New York Times unfairly treated the whole issue of Hillary Clinton's emails. And that was probably the beginning of a problem that Hillary Clinton never could overcome. And I think the New York Times was routinely unfair and blew that way out of proportion if you look at what some of the other previous Secretary of States had done with their emails, including Colin Powell, for example. So I think Donald Trump brings a lot of it on, his, on, it, on himself. I think some of it he wants. Donald Trump needs bo boogeymen. He needs bad people to attack. He needs to rile up his base to, see, to have them think that they're being treated unfairly. So I think he sets the media up in, in, in often cases. And, you know, who was the guy who uh, gave Donald Trump the, the trouble in the first debate? Chris Wallace from Fox News. Fox News. And he even complains about Fox News on occasion. So I think he revels in the this fake news, the fake news line of uh, argument that he has. I think I think that Christine and the governor are both right. Um, yes, he's brought it on himself. He was elected, I think, as the beneficiary of tremendous amount of free media four years ago. You know, he was intoxicating. It was hard to take your your eyes off of him and to know where it was going. But I would say to the governor that the media is now overcompensating and making up for last time, perhaps, for the way in which they handled Secretary Clinton's emails. Because I, I believe that Joe Biden is a very decent human being. I don't believe that Joe Biden is a, um, a corrupt individual. Uh, on that score, I don't think that there's a comparison between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. You know there's a but coming. Having said that, I have to say that the last couple of days have been unsettling because you have an individual who has come forward who seems credible, but he hasn't undergone the proctological exam that would be given to someone uh, asserting a charge uh, for the other side. And he's been completely dismissed by the media. I mean, totally ignored other than to initiate a discussion about Section 230 of the Communications Act and whether Twitter and Facebook should have shut down the New York Post. And I'm troubled by that. I'm, I'm troubled by the precedent that that sets and what it means for a media um, if all of a sudden it's President Biden in a couple of weeks. I mean, does that kind of treatment continue? So, you know, instead I, I hear that, well, that story has been investigated and it's, it's based on, on Russian misinformation. But there was a new wrinkle to it that I think was deserving of scrutiny. And so when I go back to where I began in this conversation a few minutes ago, thinking about tomorrow being the four year anniversary of Comey, if there were something to come in this final week, I don't know what level of consideration it would be given by the dominant media. And I'm troubled by that. 
Yeah, I guess I'll just quickly add that uh, I think I think there's some truth in that, but I also think that there's been a maturing, at least of the established media, and this would include the New York Times, I think, where they, uh, I think they're getting away from what I think was a false problem of always thinking it's a balanced, well, here's what the Republican side says, and here's what the Democratic side says. And I think that with Trump, the truth is that he lies a lot, and the media tended not to report that. And they tended not to report, uh, they tended to give both sides. And I think more and more uh, the media has matured in the sense of just calling uh, a lie a lie and not trying to go say, well, he said that this is true, but we can't find evidence for it. And one example I'll give was just an article that appeared recently where in a speech, Trump, they did an analysis and fact check of an entire speech and 75% of the speech was false. 25% of the speech was true. And I think that uh, uh, I, I think that four years ago, you wouldn't have had a report that was so direct. If I can just jump in on what Eric said, um, I think it was interesting the, that uh, the best of the, the worst interview that Donald Trump had from a political consequence was the Sunday interview we had with Chris Wallace, where he said uh, that uh, that uh, Joe Biden had said that uh, he wanted to defund the police, and Chris Wallace said no, he didn't, and Donald Trump said yes, he did. It was in the material that he put out with Bernie Sanders. Chris Wallace said, "Do you have it with you?" And Trump said, "It's in my car." He said, "Go get it and show me." And of course, Trump couldn't go get it and show them because it didn't exist. But to come close to home, um, Governor, with respect to that, uh, you're right, obviously, about that. But what that about the autopsy true. that was done? <laughs> I voted for you many times. Um, but what about the autopsy that was not done on Joe Biden's statement at the end of the last debate? Uh, where he said, oh, I never said that we were going to end fracking. The whole issue of the oil industry. Um, he was given a basic pass on the fact that he really did, he's on tape admitting that he wants to end fracking. That, And you know how important that is in Pennsylvania. And then on the tarmac outside, he started backing away from it and making, well, you know, we're going to end subsidies to it, but we're not going to end the industry. I mean, yeah, I agree. Donald Trump says some whoppers and they need to be, he needs to be held accountable for that. But when is Joe Biden going to be held accountable for the whoppers that he is, or, or he or his surrogates are saying, and it doesn't seem to be done or it fades away into the ether after a couple of hours. So, I mean, I just wanted to point out that, you know, it's not whataboutism here, but it's happening with Joe Biden as well. On that topic of fracking, I do have a question um, specifically for Governor Rendell, um, because Pennsylvania has a large fracking industry and you were essentially the leader of Pennsylvania um, at the time when the fracking industry was really, I, I would say beginning, but becoming prominent. Um, my, I have a question from my progressive caucus chair who could not make it. Um, and he says, in spite of arguments from climate science groups, such as the International Panel on Climate Change and grassroots organizations, um, Joe Biden and his team have repeatedly spoken in support of the fracking industry. Will strong measures against climate change always be viewed as unpalatable to run on? Um, or is a change in this area possible? Um, and I was hoping you could also sort of speak on how Pennsylvanians sort of view fracking. Um, and do you think that this is sort of a defining issue for Pennsylvania. I know we talked about in the beginning that the defining issue is Trump versus Biden, but I would argue fracking is a really big deal. Um, yeah, and let me c correct Christine. Uh, Joe Biden said he was against fracking on, gov on government land, on federal land. He never said he was against fracking. And I know this for a fact because as you said, Sarah, I was governor at the time that the technology became into being that could allow for this deep drilling that's called fracking. The year before, we had 90, excuse me, 70 permits for deep drilling. My last year as governor, my administration allowed 3,000 permits for fracking. 
to be issued and fracking took place and it never looked back. Why? Because it is tremendously positive for economic growth and development in Pennsylvania. It did a lot to bring back the steel industry with the big wells and drills that had to be produced. It gave farmers who thought they would die poor, gave farmers a license to let fracking go on in their land, which gave them a steady income and something they could leave to their kids. It revived towns, towns that had little restaurants go out of business. They all came flooding back as people came into those towns to, to work and to, 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 to do the work that's necessary to achieve fracking. So it was very good for Pennsylvania. There's no question about it. Um, secondly, fracking, uh, you can make a case that fracking is good for the environment. Right now, Sarah, how much of Pennsylvania's electricity comes from solar and wind? How much of it comes I find myself from... unaware of that. I'm not entirely mm -hmm. sure. I know that it's a, it's a changing Take percentage. A Take a shot. 15%. Not bad, 11%. Nuclear accounts for another 30, and the remaining 60 is mostly coal, coal burning. Now, burning natural gas as a food stock for electricity is 50% less carbon producing than burning coal. 50% less carbon producing. So, we need a bridge to the time when there will be renewables sufficient to produce all of our electricity in Pennsylvania. That may be 2040, 2035, it may be 2050, but we need a bridge and burning natural gas to produce electricity is 50% better for the environment than burning coal. So you can have fracking and produce economic benefits for the state of Pennsylvania and for the people of Pennsylvania and at the same time, make it a positive step as a bridge, a positive step for temporarily cleaning the environment up fairly significantly. Governor, yeah, you I, should have been at the debate. You should have answered that question at the debate. That was, that was the answer that should have been given, but that wasn't the answer that was given by, by um, Vice President Biden. That was a great answer. Fracking is an important part of Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania economy as well. Um, that was not the impression that people came away from uh, that I talked to after the debate. So uh, your answer is great. I just don't know why uh, Vice President Biden didn't give that same answer. Well, I, I agree that might have been that Biden would have liked to call on Governor Rendell to answer the question. <laughs> Unfortunately, he wasn't <laughs> able to do that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but I think that there's another perspective I just wanted to offer um, going on to, you know, with respect to the end fracking quote. And I, I think part of what Governor Rendell is just saying is that thinking of natural gas as a bridge fuel is a good way to think about it. And to say that you eventually do have to end fracking doesn't give a time frame. And so I think if you look at the, at the combined unified Democratic Party proposal, which is a combination of Biden uh, being somewhat more moderate and conservative on this and the progressives coming to an agreement about it, uh, there is a general consensus in the climate scientist community that you do eventually have to end both, uh, well, both coal and fracking and natural gas. Uh, but but it, you, but there's a time, it's a question of time. And so I think that was the, maybe the error in, uh, in, in Biden's answer is that he didn't really talk about, put this in a time frame context. And maybe that would have helped to be a better. I agree with you, though, Christine, that it wasn't his best answer. And I don't think, I also don't think he pleased a lot of people on the progressive side either with the answer. But one last thing is, if you want to criticize Biden and the Democrats on this, there is zero plan on the other side, right? The other side doesn't even recognize that we even have a climate problem. So I think that it's, it's, you're, you're beating something with nothing. You have something on Biden's side and you have nothing on the other side except denial. With that, I'm going to move on to uh, a question from our Libertarian Caucus Chair, and I'm going to combine it for, with an audience question from Michael Cohen. Um, so, because I think they go well together. So our Libertarian Caucus Chair um, asks, what potential legal challenges um, should we anticipate? Should a decisive outcome not occur with this election? And Michael Cohen asks, um, uh, 
Is it a realistic fear that the Supreme Court could invalidate all mail-in ballots that aren't counted by election night, even if they were received well before the election? Um, we have some people well-versed in, in law and the, the court system here. So uh, what Let are your thoughts? Let me first back at that. No, you can't invalidate ballots that uh, were received by election night um, b because they're perfectly legal. Um, and the, the absentee ballot law, which is still the controlling law because we, didn't, we changed to mail voting without an excuse necessary, but we didn't change the timing law. As long as the ballots are postmarked or received by the election day, they should be counted. And that's pretty clear and, and no one's gonna change that. Yeah, I guess I'll, I, I, I am a little bit concerned about what the Supreme Court might do. And as Governor Rendell indicated, and, and as you read in the papers, there's a huge number of these mail-in ballots that are, that are being cast. And so there's going to be some time. And, and as you have, an, as I think it's nice in the, in the title of the panel that you have election day in quotes, because it seems fairly clear that we're going to have to wait a couple days uh, Pennsylvania can't even start counting, as the governor indicated, until the election day. We, and we have all these millions of ballots. You just don't have that many machines and workers. You're going to have to give it time. And what I worry about a little bit is that if there's more confusion and there is some uncertainty, and so some states come in one way and it's relatively clear, and then a lot of the bigger states are going to need to take more time, then one of the worries I have is that this idea that mail-in ballots somehow have given the opportunity for fraud is going to be given some airtime on Fox News and some other places. It, even though the president continues to say that mail-in ballots cause a problem with fraud, there's zero evidence. There's no academic study that's found any problem with mail uh, ballot fraud. And there's some indication in the opinion that uh, Justice Kavanaugh, a concurring opinion Justice Kavanaugh just gave, that he might lend his authority to this idea that we that the court needs to weigh in to stop counting at some point for the for the for the benefit of some election certainty or some kind of resolving the chaos and that's what i worry a little bit about because that was the rationale that the the supreme court used in Bush versus Gore in 2000, when the Supreme Court stepped in and said, okay, there's enough counting. We're just declaring the election for this side on this ground, where, on this ground and the ground was really legally pretty weak. But a lot of people said, okay, it's down to Florida. It's close. We do have to have some resolution. And what I worry about is if we have too much chaos, and, it, and, and I'm hopeful there won't be, that this can get thrown into the Supreme Court and it could be a problem. But I hope that I'm wrong about that. But I think there are a lot of people worrying about it. I absolutely would, agree with the professor. Um, go ahead, Michael, I'm sorry. No, I, go ahead, Christine. I, I'm just... I just have a very quick comment to make. I, I absolutely agree with the professor. Um, I, you know, I'm worried that um, there is such confusion right now. I'm worried about early voting. I'm worried about mail-in versus uh, in-person. Um, my polling place has been changed. My polling place of 40 years, four decades, was just changed this year with very little notice. Um, I do immigration law. I have represented individuals who have sought asylum because they were poll watchers in their own countries and were either beaten, were either intimidated, had you know huge problems because of the work that they were doing on the front line. I never imagined that there was that in my own country I was going to have this this unsettling sense that you know that that the answer that we may get on election day is not the answer that's going to withstand scrutiny. And I do not want to return to 2000 and Bush v. Gore. That really uh, just separated the country in two pieces. And I don't think we fully recovered from that decision. The Supreme Court's reputation definitely has not. What I was going to say in line with the professor's comment is that I've tried to train myself to refer to uh, next week as the final day of voting instead of calling it election day, just to try and do a little part to instill in people that, okay, that's the final day that you vote, but it's not necessarily the end. I'm worried that given the, the president's comments laying a predicate about 
mail-in voting being associated with fraud, that if in fact it's a close election and we go to bed on that Tuesday night without knowing the outcome, that people will naturally assume that what he said has some truth and that there must be something nefarious taking place when in fact it will be human factors because human factors always play a role in this. I, I actually brought a, uh, a prop tonight. Um, David Litt was an Obama speech writer and he wrote a book called Democracy. And there's just one paragraph that I want to read where he says the following. Imagine hearing the following pitch on Shark Tank, a nationwide mega chain with no corporate headquarters and no CEO. It will operate eight times as many US locations as McDonald's, serving twice as many customers despite having about half as many employees. Each location will experience nearly double the daily foot traffic of your average Starbucks. Not only that, but every one of these approximately 115,000 stores will be a pop-up, remaining open for a single day and then closing for good at night. And oh, by the way, the more than 900,000 workers will be woefully underpaid. That is election day in America. And I thought it was such a great encapsulation of the way that we create this pop-up one day a year, relying on a workforce that don't do this for a living. And then we're surprised when, you know, stuff happens. Stuff always happens. Things will go awry in carrying out this election, but that won't be indicative of fraud. And that's the message that I wish that more in the media would convey so as to set straight what people's expectations are. Yeah, the media didn't do, I think Michael's right, the media didn't do a very good job on this issue at all. When President Trump, a couple of weeks ago, complained about these eight ballots that were found in a creek in Pennsylvania, seven of whom had Trump, voted for Trump, um, mail-in ballots, he forgot to mention that this was Luzerne County, which as you know, Michael, is controlled by Republicans. So the election apparatus is controlled by Republicans. He forgot to mention that one point. Certainly would have shot a hole in his conspiracy theory. Right. With that, I am going to move on to some audience questions. Um, another audience question. Um, and I would like to remind the audience that they have the ability to submit questions either through the Q&A um, at the, the bottom of their screen or through the form, which Mark has been sending out throughout. Um, the form allows for anonymity if you would like that. Um, and with that, um, the question I'm going to ask is from uh, Timothy Martinson. Um, specifically, I'm going to ask it to uh, Mr. Smirkanish because he was he had an excellent debate um, with the Penn Political Union a couple of years ago on a very similar topic of partisanship. Um, so how do you see the Republican and Democratic parties um, and the country itself going forward in regards to partisanship in a post-Trump world, whether it be 2021 or 2025? Um, do you believe they will go further away from the American political center and not work together or closer to one end of the spectrum? Um, a la a national, a na nationwide, nationwide conservative shift um, with Reaganism in the uh, uh, 1980s. Well, I think that there's this tendency for people who don't like President Trump to assume that it's all about him and all we need to do is get rid of Donald Trump and then we return to some sense of normalcy. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a moment because the forces that elected Donald Trump were worldwide. Brexit happened before the Trump election. There have been a number of populist movements around the globe in the last several years that I, I think are brought about by uh, the world being flat, to quote Tom Friedman, brought about by technological change, brought about by concerns among some as to where they fit in, in a, in a world of changing demographics. I mean, there were a lot of factors that gave rise to Donald Trump and a hell of a lot of Americans who put him in office and a lot who are about to vote for him again, even if he loses, their grievances will still be among us and need to be addressed. So I don't think that the partisan era, which precedes Trump, goes away. And I'm sure there will be a battle if he's unsuccessful for the future of the Republican Party, and that many will lay claim to you know, his brand of the GOP. I also expect that there will be a number of conservative never-Trumpers 
who try and reassert themselves in the party. John Kasich comes to mind. And so I think there'll be a battle for, for what the future Republican Party might look like. And oh, by the way, one of the individuals who I think will play a role in that battle, even if he loses, is Donald Trump. Because I don't think he's finished with this process until he's really finished. So I think the future looks quite chaotic for the GOP in particular, and I'm not sure which side of that battle wins. I mean, the party today doesn't resemble the party that I joined on Ronald Reagan's watch back in the 1980s when you had 60% of the Senate comprised of moderates and so many moderates in the Republican caucus in the Senate that they had their own gathering that they called the Wednesday Lunch Club. It's a significantly different world and I don't know if it ever goes back to where it was. It is, and, and Michael is absolutely right in everything that he uh, uh, recounted there. And it is gonna be problematic even if Donald Trump is defeated. Uh, but I will say that I think Joe Biden is the right person for this moment in the development of the American government, because I, I, he is as good a consensus builder as we have. It doesn't mean he's gonna be able to do it. But one of the things I did very successfully when I was governor, I had a Republican Senate and a Republican House for all but two years of my time, my eight years as governor. And I was fairly successful, Michael with Grant, I think, in getting stuff passed. And the way I did it, when I wanted to do an infrastructure proposal, I would bring the Republicans in. I would have them in in the discussion. I would say, read this, tell me what you don't like, and tell me what you'd add. If you had your druthers, what you'd add. And the Republicans reacted fairly responsibly. They pointed out things that they didn't like. One or two I took out, one or two I said, I've got to keep them in because of this, this, and that. And then they gave me some suggestions, a few of which I adopted into the legislation. Now, did I get every Republican vote for my infrastructure proposal? No, but I got enough Republican votes that passed and it could be called bipartisan. And I think Joe Biden will do that. And he'll do it better and more openly and honestly than I think anybody in the political system has done it in a long while. Barack Obama started off with the intentions of doing that, but stopped pretty, pretty quickly from doing that. And it became a one party government. You can't, if you want some degree of bipartisanship, you can't have a one party government. You know, um, absolutely. And uh, to, to piggyback on what, on what the governor and Michael just said, uh, there's a, a great book by Ben Bradley Jr. called The Forgotten. And it's set, it talks about Luzerne County and how Luzerne County was essentially the county that flipped um, Pennsylvania for Donald Trump and possibly was the reason that he won enough electoral votes to win in 2016. And the focus of that book was on people who felt that they were forgotten, that they had been ignored. It was, um, from, from a conservative blue collar perspective, it was, a there were a lot of blue collar Democrat, Reagan uh, Democrats who ended up voting for Trump because they felt they were being left behind the fracking, the coal industries, a lot of the, you know, the old industrial, the Rust Belt. On the other hand, you have groups, you have um, minority groups, you have uh, women, you have other groups on the left, for example, who feel that they've been uh, ignored, that their rights, that their uh, beliefs, that their, um, basically their needs have been taken for granted. So you have kind of the politics of grievance here. You have people who are voting from a very personal space. They feel they've been taken for granted. They feel they've been ignored. And that's what happened in Luzerne County. That's what, what's happening with a lot of people who will vote against Donald Trump because they feel, um, you know, they throw out racism and bigotry and, and what have you. I think what the governor says makes a lot of sense. You have to be a consensus builder. You can't be somebody who just focuses on this extreme group that feels a sense of grievance on either end. You cannot say you're going to, I mean, I mean, I hear that it's not just from Donald Trump. I hear that on the left. I hear people complaining. I am so happy that Amy Coney Barrett is on the Supreme Court. And yet I have had so many women tell me that I just supported a woman who will roll back 
our rights and our, our situation, our position in society for a generation, for two generations. Um, I'm not supposed to have a voice as a conservative woman. So I see this grievance happening on both ends of the political spectrum. And I agree with the, uh, the governor that we need to find a way to get, some, get a consensus builder someone who's going to be able to speak to both sides and not make one side feel, okay, I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to completely ignore the other side. We have to find some way to do it because otherwise we, we, are, we are too polarized. I honestly don't see how that's going to happen even if Joe Biden wins um, in, a, in a, you know, a week or so. May I, I really ask, don't may, know. Let me, oh, may, I if, may I ask a quick follow-up with the governor? Because I, I think the governor may leave us soon and I'd love to hear him weigh in on this before he does. Peggy Noonan had a column in the Wall Street Journal in the last couple of days, essentially arguing that the best thing that could happen to Joe Biden would be that he win the election and that Republicans maintain control of the Senate because Republican control of the Senate will give him the buffer that he requires from the most progressive influences in the Democratic Party. What's your thought on that? I think that would make sense, Michael, except for one thing. The, the way the Congress is structured, the majority leader and speaker in the House control what bills are voted on. Mitch McConnell has not allowed, I think, 74 vote bills that have come over from the House, passed the House of Representatives, has not allowed any of them to go to the floor for discussion, for amendment, or for votes. If he acts the same way, then Peggy's thesis fails, fails miserably. If he would let Biden's proposals go to the floor, yes, then the, Biden could say to his more progressive members, he could say, look, I'd love to do that, but we need some Republican votes to get this passed. And the only way we can get Republican votes to get this passed is to do this, this, and that. Not exactly what you guys want, but it's the only way we can get anything passed. Peggy would be right, except Mitch McConnell could just determine that he's not going to let anything be voted on. Now you say to yourself, Michael, that would never happen. How could Mitch McConnell do that? Well, isn't it the same Mitch McConnell who in 2016 said, we can't nominate and vote on a Supreme and confirm a Supreme Court justice in an election year when Barack Obama not nominated Merrick Garland eight months before the election and then reversed himself and said, we can nominate and confirm Amy Comey Barrett, when she was nominated about six weeks before the presidential election. You, you know, Mitch McConnell has no sense of values, doesn't want anything to work. He's just a political animal. If it were different, then I think Peggy's thesis would be exactly right. And let me say, Michael gave, gave me the ability to, to explain why I have to go. I had a previously scheduled a conference call where I'm working with, believe it or not, Michael, Bernie Sanders folks, to try to <laughs> convince progressive voters to vote for some of our Senate candidates in states like Maine, Iowa, and Montana, where, as you know, they're all within the margin of error, and where there are progressive Sanders voters who are saying they won't vote for the Democrat. So we're raising money to try to communicate with them online through digital ads, through phone calls, through even some door knocking, et cetera. So uh, I apologize. It's a great discussion, and you have a great panel, and you won't miss me a bit. So thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you so Sarah. much for coming. Thank yes. Thank you, Governor. Bye, Governor. OK, so I have a, another question, uh, which I'm going to combine, combine with a question from uh, Jen Minkovich, uh, an audience question. Um, so. Basically, I want to shift the panel sort of to, to look at uh, where we see the future um, after this election going. Um, it, it's a, we're setting a precedent here with presidential elections. Um, and the first question is going to be Jen's, and then I'm going to add a little bit of follow-up. Um, in a scenario where Trump appears to be ahead in the polls on November 3rd um, and declares a victory or tries to force Biden to concede the election be before all mail-in ballots are counted, um, what is an appropriate uh, response by the media um, and by the American people? And I would want to combine that with, uh, do you see that, do you see 
um, mail-in ballots and early voting playing a more important role than they have in the past in future elections um, because of the, the precedent set by this year. Well, I guess I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll let uh, the, the, the media people here <laughs> answer the media question, but I think with respect to what people can be ready to do, and I think there's some concern about this is, if there really was an overreach and the president said, the mail-in ballots are fraudulent, the, uh, the ballots that count are the ones that were able to be counted on election day, I am therefore president and I'm going to litigate this and et cetera, make up arguments and it looks like there's something that could be brought forward. I think there's a, then the, the, the people have to get ready to protest in the streets. You, you have to have a mass demonstration as you've seen in other, uh, other countries where if there really is an autocratic move to, to declare legal ballots that were mailed in and there's no reason to actually think there's any fraud, if you have the President of the United States trying to say there is and trying to stay in power when we're not counting all the votes in a fair way, people have to get, in my view, they have to get in the streets because that's the only thing that will then, uh, will then have any influence. Uh, it is possible for uh, now, I think there are other institutions, including our military and others, that will not allow that to be. So there's other buffers that we have, uh, but then as well as the media. But I think protests are probably uh, to be called for in, in that kind of hypothetical. Do either of our uh, media personnel here think that the media has should have a response to this? Do you, do you believe that there is an impetus for the, the media to denounce this or is that not their role? Well, I, I think, uh, I hope, and I'm optimistic that the media will be responsible and not get caught up in the usual rush. I, I know what this is like because I had a front row seat in 2016 as a CNN panelist for nine hours that night. In fact, I remember I was supposed to be on from seven until midnight and someone tapped me on my shoulder and said, we've got the next crew to come in. And I said, I, I'm not leaving until this thing is, is over and never went to bed that night and just remained on television until it was over. And I know what it's like to be sitting there on the set, uh, facing John King, working his magic wall, looking 10 feet away at Wolf Blitzer who is through his earpiece is IFB being told what states he can call. And there's this tremendous pressure to be the first to call a particular state. And we panelists, if we're not on television at the time, are sitting there looking at our laptops, well aware via Twitter, or by looking at the uh, websites of competing networks, we're well aware of whether another network has already called the state. And they get caught up in it because they wanna be first and they want people to be hanging on the words of one particular outlet because they've got the, the fastest information. It asks a lot, but I sure hope that that's not what the night of the election is going to look like next week. Uh, I hope that they don't get too far out in front of their skis wanting to be first because it'll only fuel the issues that we're, we're now discussing. I feel very confident that at least with regard to CNN that they're going to err on the side of caution and not want to get caught up in any kind of a declaration about who has won the race uh, until they, they know it and that they're perfectly comfortable in letting it go on for a period of days if that's what the vote counting suggests. But the media today is whatever you want it to be, right? The media today is anybody with a laptop and a pair of pajamas. So I'm concerned about where that goes. And I also think it'll be interesting to pay attention to the social media platforms and to see what the response is from a Facebook or from a Twitter on this very issue. When some people wanna to get too far out in front and say that someone won the election when in fact that's not clear. You know, um, what I, I'm really glad Michael mentioned social media because social media is more important now than it has ever been, including in the 2016 election. I think my sadness comes in part from sort of the, um, the default position, the presumption that if Donald Trump wins, there has been a 
there has been fraud. If Joe Biden wins, there has been fraud. On either side of this divide, you, are, you have people who are already predisposed to question, not just question, but to condemn the result. It's almost, and, and then this idea of, of, I mean, I'm hearing language being used now, not, not necessarily in the establishment media, although it has happened there, but in a lot of social media posts as well, of a, of, of, of a coup of a seven days in May kind of scenario. You're probably too young, Sarah, to remember that great film with Burt Lancaster and, and Kirk Douglas. But this idea, you know, people talking about the military, we're not going to allow the, you know, the, the, the president to uh, take over the government. There will be uh, marching in the streets. I mean, come on, I deal with that. I have dealt with that with Iraqi refugees. I've dealt with that with Albanian refugees. I think we are bigger and better than that in the United States. And I am really saddened and nervous and, and angry that there is rhetoric out there now that is, is almost you know, fueling this idea that no matter who wins, whatever happens here, it's, it's not legitimate. I mean, let's take a step back and as Michael says, I do think that the media are going to be fair and they're going to be a reflection of what's happening. They're not gonna try and steer it in one direction or another, but let's take a deep breath here and, and talk of, of uh, you know, this, this um, anticipatory talk of fraud and um, going to the courts and this and that. We have to be very, very careful when we start using that kind of language a week out from an election. I have a lot more faith in the American people and in this system, then I think a lot of, a lot of unfortunately, a lot of people with, with uh, pulpits um, are giving it. Well, I guess I'll, I just want to mention one thing, and I, I think what I, I would agree with everything you say, um, except for one point, and that is the main person who is crying fraud in a big way and saying all mail-in voting is fraudulent is the President of the United States at every single rally, and, he's, and it's being repeated through social media and every other outlet. So that's my concern is we really have to, we really have to counter that. I think, I think Michael, you mentioned earlier that that's a role of the media, uh, but it's, uh, that's my concern is that you have the president saying that and he's fueling this more than, I think on the other side, I think Biden has said clearly that if he loses, then he ran a bad campaign that's, and, he, and he lost. He'll have a transition of power. It's the, it's the unprecedented situation that we have where, where the president of the United States is saying, I'm going to contest the election unless I win. That's scary. Yeah, and you're right. You're right, Professor. I, I actually do agree with that. I think it's unfortunate when you have, um, in this case, the president saying those things on a regular basis. It really does undermine a sense of security in the election. But, and, and he does have the loudest voice, but that voice, his voice is multiplied many, many times by people on the left as well. But I, I do agree with you. I, I think that it's extremely unfortunate for him to be coming out there and making those statements at rallies. It should not be, it, he should not be doing that. It's very funny, all of this conversation, because my professor um, in one of my classes today said, we're not gonna have class on election day, but we'll also reevaluate if we'll have class after election day, because you never know, there might be civil unrest. And uh, I like was listening in class at like 9.30 in the morning and I was like still hazy from sleep. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I haven't thought that far. That's a wow. But um, yeah, so with that, I kind of want to move into our, our, one of our final questions. Um, I was reading something very interesting today um, about early voting, um, but specifically the demographics of early voting. And if you look at the demographics, um, especially in uh, young voters, you see that the youth voters are turning out in unprecedented, unprecedented numbers, um, especially to vote early. Um, and I, I was kind of wondering, what electorate group do you see being the most important in, in this election? We know that the, the previous election in 2016, the electorate to look out for that was really shocking were the, the middle-aged white women who voted for Trump and essentially tipped the, the election in, in favor of Trump by some arguments. Um, do you think the youth are previously previous elections youth haven't really had a strong turnout or as strong as older voters, but 
do you think this election is going to be different? Um, do you think that uh, what electorate group do you see being the most influential or critical um, for either candidate to win to win the election? I'll go first and say that I look at this election as a race uh, of demography versus geography. And demography and the demographics are not on the, uh, the long-term side uh, of Republicans. Donald Trump really needs to go to the well one more time and, and see if he can get that last bit of pulp when squeezing an orange or a grapefruit or a lemon from high school educated white males. He was able to get a disproportionate number of them to come out four years ago at a time when Hillary Clinton couldn't replicate the Obama constituency. And those groups that were down in voting in 2016, people of color, uh, women, a number of demographics that Barack Obama was able to bring out uh, that she couldn't and fell short by a few points that he was able to make up for with this rural rebellion. That's what I'm talking about when I, see, when I say geography. I've never believed that this was a persuasion election. It's, it's not an election. And, and by the way, I've, I've spent a lot of time because I'm taken with it, interviewing one particular guest on a repeat basis on my radio show who has conducted focus groups in swing areas among swing voters for the last year and a half. And every time he's concluded one of them, I bring him into the studio and interrogate him as to what he learned. Uh, pretty fascinating that the swing voters, those who voted for Barack Obama and then switched to Donald Trump, largely are sticking with him. I used to draw some significance from that. I really don't now. I don't think it's about persuading people. I don't think it's about people who voted one way and now are going to vote another. I think it's all about passion and motivation, not persuasion, motivation. Which side has the motivated base? And Sarah, to your point, yes, uh, the suggestions are that young people are among those who are showing up and voting early. I, I mean, common sense seems to suggest that Joe Biden has banked a lot of votes. Um, and, and now it remains to be seen whether Trump can similarly motivate his base to come out like they did in 2016. Uh, when I have said before to Trump campaign officials, well, you need to go to the well and make sure each of those people comes back, they like to correct me and say, we actually think that there was more meat on the bone, that there was more of a constituency for us, but people didn't show up who would have voted for us because they thought that it was over and that Donald Trump had no shot. I, I don't know. I, I just don't know where it ends. And my specific answer to your question, if I were looking at one particular demographic, and this might surprise you, would be seniors. Because uh, Trump did well with seniors. Um, he's not doing well compared to 2016, given that Joe Biden is, uh, is making inroads uh, among those folks. So um, yeah, kind of interesting that a 74-year-old and a 77-year-old are, are, are doing battle uh, for this, um, and that young people are going to play a significant role. Those are my thoughts. Yeah, I, I guess I'll jump in now uh, and, and just, well, first of all, agree with everything Michael just said. I think he has a good analysis. And also I was really interested in the example you gave at the beginning where there was a poll taken four years ago and now there's a poll taken again and there's really almost no change. And so if that's true, then what really matters is turnout. And so I agree that uh, the, a, a big turnout of younger voters will mean a Biden victory, because if you if you look at if things have not changed, then that's what that's the demographic. One of the big driving issues there, um, from my perspective, and I think that this is borne out in polls, is climate change. The Republicans have completely given up on that issue. I think one thing that may change if there is a Democratic landslide is that the Republicans will shift back, and you'll see a lot of young Republicans actually are also very strong on that issue and they would like to see the party change. So I think younger voters, I'd also like to agree um, that with two other demographics, one is, um, one is the black vote and, the, and, the, uh, and, other, uh, minor, and other people of color are coming out very strongly for Biden this time. They're not going to stay home as many of them did in Hillary in the, in the Hillary Clinton case. You see that in Philadelphia. When I voted, there was already these, there were these huge lines. So the vote is coming out in Philadelphia uh, in a big way there. 
And then with respect to the older vote, I think that the COVID-19, we haven't talked a lot about COVID, but I think that the, uh, the COVID-19 mishandling is really going to be a big shift. And you see this one, one of the states that could go to Biden, and then if it does, it's all over, is Florida. And there's a big shift there where uh, the, C, the older vote in Florida went for Trump last time, and the polling right now is showing them significantly moving toward Biden. And I think part of it is they're scared <laughs> of dying and that they feel like it's not been, the issue's not been handled. And they've seen a lot of their friends die and their family, they can't see their grandkids, et cetera. And if that's true, that's the other main demographic. And if the turnout's big among all those groups, then I think you have a Biden victory. I think, um, demographic wise, it's very difficult for me to say that any one particular group is really going to drive this election. Obviously, the youth vote is important. Um, you know, I belong to several groups, um, hidden Facebook groups, other groups which are not public groups. I happen to be very public in my conservatism, in my positions. There are a lot of people who are like me, who think like me, who have the same um, uh, concerns, I guess. Uh, I'm pro-life, I'm anti-abortion. There are many, many women who are like me, but who are afraid to speak out because of the reaction that they get, particularly in Southeastern Pennsylvania, which is a very, very blue area. Um, so while I, I, I'm inclined to believe that there is a lot of support for Joe Biden. The support for Joe Biden is very vocal. People are not afraid to be out there um, expressing their support for Joe Biden because he is actually not an extreme. He is not the he is the the least extreme of all of the Democratic candidates who were running in the primaries. People are afraid, if you can believe it you know, discounting all of the rallies with the MAGA hats and everything. There is an untapped silent group of people who support Donald Trump, um, including among minority communities, but they do not feel comfortable coming out and saying that. They will not put a Trump sign on their front lawn, but they will vote for Donald Trump. Now, is that a large enough demographic group that it's going to sway the election? I really don't know. But I can say that the polls don't always tell the story. And we saw that in 2016. And I do understand that it's different, that there was real disaffection and, and dislike, personal, not, you know, not hatred, but not liking Hillary Clinton. And Joe Biden does not inspire that same sort of enmity in a lot of people. But I really don't think the election is as, um, I think it's a lot closer than people, than the polls would suggest, simply because of the people that I've spoken to who are Trump supporters, but who will absolutely not say anything because they're afraid their kids are going to get bullied in school. Uh, they're afraid they're going to have things happen to them in their neighborhoods. So you know, we'll see what happens. But I, I do think that that demographic, maybe the non-demographic, the invisible demographic, is going to be extremely important and relevant in the election. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to turn uh, the closing over to our president, Justin Greenman, um, president of the Government and Politics Association. Justin? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, and once again, I just want to thank our panelists. I know Governor Rendell had to leave a little early, but I want to thank the three of you for sticking around for, um, excuse me, for taking our questions that were submitted by the Penn Political Union for taking some audience questions. Um, I definitely learned a lot. I don't know if I necessarily feel better um, <laughs> listening to this, but I definitely feel um, kind of, you know, I, I, as I believe Professor Ords brought up, there's, there's a, a, a reason why we did, we titled it election day in quotation marks. This is definitely going to be an election day like no other. Um, and especially, you know, whether, you know, as Governor Vendell said earlier, whether Pennsylvania is at the center of it or not, we know that it's going to be very important. So I want, like I said, I want to thank you all again. Um, I want to thank Sarah and the Penn Political Union for submitting their questions. I also especially want to thank the Andrea Mitchell Center uh, for partnering with us on this event and some of our other election programming. I'll just, you know, 
do a quick plug for them. I know that you know they they hold a lot. They're holding a lot of events later this week, um, leading up to the election day, talking about uh, voter suppression, talking about um, white supremacy, few other events. I definitely recommend checking them out. They're great. They, they always hold great events, whether they partner with us or not. They're always great events. Um, and I also want to thank everybody who tuned in and listened. Uh, feel free afterwards, if you're interested in learning more about GP, GPA or the Penn Political Union, to reach out to us. Um, we have a Facebook page. It's just GPA, uh, Government Politics Association. We also have a website. Um, thank you again, everybody. Um, I don't think I'm the one who's in charge of uh, disabling the recording. But once again, just thank you all for coming. Um, and I hope that you all have a safe um, and productive week. If you have not voted, I recommend that you obviously do so. Um, you have until November 3rd. I believe today is also the last day to register, if I'm not mistaken, in Pennsylvania, but there are still opportunities um, to vote in person. So I definitely recommend doing that. Thank you. That was, it was the last day to uh, put a mail-in ballot was last day. It's already passed the registration. So, I have I'm about registered in New Jersey, so I can't, I can't speak. Um, we, we have universal vote by <laughs> It's a very different, uh, very different election this year. Thank you.